Welcome to Season 2 of the UX Coach Podcast. This time around, we are expanding on our exploration into careers in digital design and user research to look into the challenges encountered by hiring managers and those new to the industry wanting to make good progress. In this episode, I'm in conversation with Joe O'Keefe, who's lead user researcher with the Care Quality Commission in England. We had the opportunity to catch up at the end of summer 2019 to talk about how Joe came into the user research field, what it's like to be at the start of a movement in a large organisation, and the opportunities that we think we have ahead with the school leavers of 2020. So let's jump in. Joe, thank you very much for joining us uh, today on the UX Coach podcast. Very nice to be here. Thank you. Let's get going with talking about what you're doing right now, because you're so you're at the uh, Care Quality Commission, which I think quite a few people in the UK will probably be familiar with because it has a habit of cropping up a lot in the news when something's gone really wrong. It but really does, yes. Yeah, let's start off with just uh, um, explaining a little bit about what CQC does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so CQC is the regulator of health and social care in England. So that means we are responsible for overseeing um, doctors, dentists, hospitals, care homes, care in the community, mental health units, Um, anybody who is undertaking sort of a regulated care activity um, and it's our responsibility to make sure that they're you know up to scratch that they're giving care to a good standard that they're striving to improve that people are safe no one's at risk and that things are delivered in you know the best way possible for the patient or the user of those services so you're right people don't tend to hear about us when we're just quietly working away in the background checking everything and and looking after the organisations that are doing a good or an okay job. It's usually when um, something quite awful has happened that we tend to hit the headlines, which, um, yeah, is, is, is difficult as, uh, for people who who work here because, you know, we, you know, 99.9% of the time, the work's brilliant, everything's going well, people are putting their heart and soul into it. And when that very small percent of things that we're involved in hit the news, that that's quite hard for people to take. And what is it that is your role there? So I head up user research and performance analytics. So um, user research was quite new for CQC when I joined. So I joined about 16 months ago now, and I was the first user researcher that I ever employed. So um, I came in to sort of set it up as a profession within the organisation. And as part of that, sort of took on the analytics side of, of that that piece as well, which um, does sort of model how GDS, Government Digital Services, have, have set up their professions more recently, but it was a little bit more fluky than, than intentional um, for us. So, um, I look after the user research that is going on across the organisation. So, we've got a real mix of quite, you know, familiar digital agile projects that are, you know, working through those phases and, you know, user researchers you would quite easily recognise. We've also got things that are a little bit different, that are more in the sort of policy and strategy space that user researchers are working on. And we've also got a couple of quite big IT transformational things that are happening um, that we've got a user research presence on there. So that's fusing, I guess, the sort of agile user-centered world with the more sort of waterfall style of of project delivery, which is um, experimental. (laughs) So we're trying that out. So being a relatively new team, um, I'm guessing that quite a lot of the work that you've been doing is defining what the remit is. So where where do you actually sit within the organisation? So not where you'd expect us to, to be honest. So we we don't sit in the bit of the organisation that's called digital. We actually sit in the part that's called strategy and intelligence, which sounds much grander than, uh, <laughs> than what I feel we deserve. So we share a directorate with um, an engagement team. So they're a real mix of people. So there's quite a lot of um, quite traditional comms professionals in there you know there's people who do a lot of work with ministers and parliament and and that side of the sort of relationship and communication side of things and then we have people who are a little bit more aligned with us as user researchers who do other types of research what I would call more sort of social research or evaluation type research so Mm. yeah we're a bit of a mixed bag really. I mean that in terms of a title that actually sounds like a pretty good department to be in Mm. like 
a lot of us end up in positions where we're in within IT. Yeah. So do you find that it's actually supporting you a little bit better? Um, I think there's definitely pros and cons. And I think, you know, throughout my user research sort of career, I've been in digital teams, I've been in policy teams, I've been in more sort of comms focused teams. So I think they all work and don't work in different ways. I think the pro for me is definitely that the people around me understand research. They understand that sort of basic methodology, you know, the considerations we have around recruiting participants, ethical stuff, cost, you know, incentives, those kind of things they really understand and get. I think um, the challenge is really understanding how we maybe do things a little bit differently and how quite often the time scales that we would be working to so in a sprint cycle we need things to happen quite quickly whereas some of the people we work with who are more used to sort of commissioning research or working with your Ipsos's or you know those kind of organizations and things are, are, are bigger projects and on a bit of a slower track than, than sometimes the way that we do things so it's generally great but you know there's always a con to every situation is that affording you the ability to be able to take more time and go deeper in things as well though um i think it's probably affording an opportunity to bring other people and and expertise and insight into that user research space. So um, the rest of the people in our engagement team are a great source of information for me for sort of, you know, a starting point on things, you know, work that they've done in the past. They're very good at understanding the current sentiment around things that we do, whether that's with the public or whether it's with providers or whether it's with, um, you know, internal people as well. So they're really, they've really got their finger on the pulse, I guess, about how people are feeling about stuff so it's really helpful for us to play that into the work that we're doing I think the demands of of what's going on in our organization more broadly and the transformation timetable and you know the 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 sign off in terms of budget that's associated that probably doesn't allow us to slow down but it's certainly um complementing our work and helping us to maybe um get where we need to be a little bit more efficiently, if that makes sense. Let's just take a step back a little bit then. How did you get to where you are now? So I I know of you from uh, reading quite a lot uh, when you were at DWP. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've, you've done work within uh, central UK government. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit more about that and what happened in between and around yeah. that. <laughs> so I worked at DWP for... Well, probably more years than I want to admit to, to be honest. I started there when I was a naive little early 20s somebody um, and I started off managing job centres. Um, so I worked frontline operations in DWP for probably about eight or 10 years and you burn out in that very quickly. It's a young person's game. It's hard, very hard. And from there, I sort of got into the kind of performance improvement arena, I would guess. So um, work still working very closely with operational teams, helping them, you know, make efficiencies, which is what central government's about a lot of the time. Um, and, and that sort of morphed as the years went on more into that sort of, I guess, lean slash customer insight sort of space. This sort of shift happened probably, I don't know, seven or eight years ago in DWP, where it became that realisation that people had that actually, if we looked at this from a customer point of view, as we would have said then, we can probably make things better for the business. So there was that sort of gradual shift and I started working in that area and I was working um, on a universal credit project and just out of the blue, this is probably six or seven years ago now, somebody said to me, oh, we're, we're doing this thing in a lab in London. I was like, what, what, what thing in a lab? What are you talking about? Oh, we're going to get some people to apply for universal credit on their phones and see how it goes. And I was like, oh, okay, that's really relevant to the bit of work I'm doing. I'll go along and, and have a look. And it sounds quite dramatic and I am quite a dramatic person. So, But it was just this moment of realisation that this is the job that I should have always been doing. And this this was 
me. This was everything that I felt was important. It was a great match for my skill set. And I wanted to do that job. And so the user research profession in, in DWP was just sort of getting uh, started at that point. And a lot of their expertise was coming from outside. And I managed to, um, well, plead, beg, coerce my way in and, and get them to give me a shot sort of thing. And they put me on a six month trial to see if I was any good. Um, and thankfully it all worked out and it, it really felt from day one, like the, the, the job that was the right job for me. So I got in, started doing UR in, in DWP and uh, sort of worked my way up um, through a couple of levels there and um, got to senior user researcher there and then made the, made the jump over to to more that that sort of more senior role again here at CQC. That is fascinating. <laughs> Just the the idea of stumbling into something and going, "Whoa, <laughs> I want to do what they're doing." Yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was such a moment. It really was. I remember. Yeah, I remember that day so clearly because uh, I was, you know, everybody else who was in the observation room was maybe you know, like observers do sometimes thinking this is like a bit of a day out or it's, it's interesting, but there's some magnums in the fridge and oh, having a nice sandwich and isn't this lovely. And I practically had my nose pressed against the screen, like just <laughs> absolutely riveted by what was going on. So yeah, it was, um, oh, sounds dramatic, doesn't it? But it was quite life-changing. It was like, yeah, mm. this is me. This is what I want to be doing with my life. Only took 20 years to get there, but you know, worked it out eventually <laughs> well you're here now that's yeah. the important thing um let's let's talk about that skills side of things uh a, a little bit deeper because i think that's that's a pretty fortunate situation to be in and, and you you've obviously got hustle and you can you can get yourself into the to the right places do you feel that uh in terms of trying to find the right people for these kinds of jobs there's a risk that we're overlooking people because of what they've got on their CV. Um, I think there is. And I think this is something I've thought about quite deeply um, over the last few months with trying to recruit. You know, I'm recruiting into public sector jobs. The salaries are not what Skybet or Amazon are going to be paying for UR or UX people. So, you know, you, you, you are really scrutinizing people's background looking for that sort of hint of, of potential or something transferable that we could work with and 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 you know make them into a user researcher so it is definitely mm. something I've thought about more I think you know if if certainly if I'm when I'm recruiting for senior user researchers you know I would love to find my ideal candidate who's been doing user research in government for maybe four or five years, been through the assessment process quite a few times, you know, got quite a broad range of research experience with different types of users, different project phases. But, you know, there, there's not many of us who have, have had that opportunity yet. You know, it's still very much a growing profession. So I'm really keen to look at where people are doing related things or you know research in a different sector maybe not called user research called something else but I'm really looking for that sort of um core skill of you know organizing carrying out and analyzing research you know that that focus on the user you know in whatever context it is um and, and you know that that willingness to to make the leap into the unknown, I guess. So yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. It's easy to overlook people who've who've got great transferable skills and are just looking for that opportunity to break in. Yeah, it's interesting that you say about uh, it being a growing profession because I wonder whether that is part of the challenge for finding good talent as well. Because I don't think that it is, mm -hmm. but then that's because I've had. UX designer in some guys in my job titles for the last decade. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and, and I know that it was around for a decade before that. Yeah, sure. Do you do you think that there's there is perhaps a bit of a a splintering going on now with with being more specialist? It sort of feels a little bit like the the high street challenge that we always come across, right? Is like I feel like UX designers are your your supermarkets, your Sainsbury's and whatnot. And then sometimes people actually want a grocer and a, you know, and a, and a, and a butcher. And, and that's where user researchers and interaction designers are coming 
out of. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, I think as user research, when I think about myself and when I think about my team, I feel like we're all on a spectrum almost, this sort of continuum. You know, we've all got that sort of research interest and skills, but as well as that, we've got other things that we bring to the table and some people might lean more in that sort of design space and I definitely don't, whereas other people might lean more in the sort of more business analysis, performance analysis space. I definitely don't. But then I think you've got people who are more maybe in that sort of content product space, which is probably where my other leaning mm. is. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, certainly you know, I'm very much in that, that sort of public sector arena, you know, that demand for that sort of more sort of pure research skill and that's got quite clear definition of roles is definitely there. Do I agree it's the right thing? I don't know. I don't know. We're all more than the sum of our job description, aren't mm. we? We've all got a history and different things that we bring and different things that we can offer to the project. I think there's a benefit in in having a clear definition of roles in the sense that we've all got our responsibilities and our accountabilities and we respect each other's professions. But that doesn't mean to say that we can't, in reality, offer more than just that one slice that we were recruited to do. So where do you see the the uh, hard or soft edges, if you like, of user research? I mean, at what point do you stop doing what you're doing? Is, is it just that you're responsible for, for gathering information uh, and reporting it back? Are you supposed to be actioning it in some way? What, what about for, for your teams there? What, what do you see as being kind of the handoff points? It's interesting, isn't it? Because although, like you say, we, you know, we have been quite defined now in these roles, in my experience, it works best when things get a bit blurry. So, you know, where I think I've had, you know, my best pieces of work and the best outcome from the user is where probably, you know, that, that triangle of me, interaction and content and all the the experience that we bring work really closely together and probably tread on toes quite a bit and probably, you know, do get into, I probably shout out, you know, a few interaction ideas or UX ideas and think, you know, where buttons should be or how it should look and I'll have an opinion on words. But I would always respect those roles ability and and right to overrule me on those things but it definitely I think works best when that that triangle is very collaborative and I think similarly with user research and business analysis you get a different sort of overlay there Mm. you know they've got deeply analytical minds that I really have not got but the value that we get in working together especially with internal users when you're looking at processes and system usage you know they their ability to capture that really detail on what exactly is happening with the hands and you know the mouse and the keyboard is fantastic but I would like to think that you know where I add the value is the you know the thinking and feeling you know what what is this actually meaning for that user Mm. so I think yeah I guess for me it, it does work best when when the edges are soft I guess and I think it's different on every project and every team for me as well I think you know we all bring out our whole selves to work and what we've done before and what we've seen before will will make us different to any other business analyst or interaction designer. Does that create a bit of a challenge for you in terms of what you're looking for in people then like we you mentioned previously about if you were looking for a senior person you're looking for someone with five plus years what's the uh what's What's going on in your mind there of why why does senior equal X number of years and why particularly that number? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it, it's definitely not a hard and fast number for me. Absolutely. I, I think I'm just trying to indicate quite broadly, you know, the, the, the level of expertise that I would be looking for at that level mm. and, you know, just trying to equate that with the amount of time it's probably taken for someone to build that up. But that is not a, you know, somebody who can have done two excellent years and you know had exposure to all the things I would like to have had exposure to and done a great job at it and that would be great I think the thing for me with what makes that senior need that sort of level of experience and expertise is really the autonomy that I need them to have you know um, I don't think I'm any different to any other sort of 
you know, head of in, in government in that we're super busy and juggling a lot of things. And, and certainly with our senior researchers, we need them to be quite self-sufficient most of the time and quite um, able to, you know, A, do the day job in terms of getting the research done but you know that that other side that we always have to manage about the stakeholder relationships the the conjoling and convincing and the resilience that that somebody needs to be able to do that I think is 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 where it needs that that prior expertise of a similar environment Mm. for me okay so it sounds like in terms of senior team members what we're talking about is it's a given that you can do the task-based activities the individual contributor sort of Mm -hmm. role parts yeah Mm -hmm. but that you have developed well I guess we still kind of call them soft skills really don't we but it's about Mm, being and they're not they're the hardest they are they are (laughs) so how do you how do you start to develop those is it is it something that just kind of happens are there things that people can do to be able to build on them? Yeah, I think there's probably, um, I mean, there's probably s- some element of natural aptitude. I think, you know, when I think about my team and other people I respect in this sort of user research industry, that you know, people do have maybe some sort of natural confidence and charisma, which might not have always been natural. It might be something that they've really worked at over the course of their career. I think, you know, some people are a bit more in tune to that. Some people do really have to work at it. And I'm probably somewhere in the middle. Um, I'm not always the most confident. So I do work hard at pretending to be sometimes. Um, And I think it's, for me, it's that exposure to different scenarios. So I think, you know, when I've got new researchers who, you know, they're getting on really well with, like you say, that day-to-day task-based approach, but I need them to sort of hone those more influence in negotiating skills. I think it's really just a case of me of of supporting them to get involved in some of those conversations, maybe do a little bit of observation to start with and see how other people um, approach it. And, you know, in just, trying to transfer some of those skills around you know to influence somebody you need to understand them a little bit first and getting them to you know work on the relationships that they've got with stakeholders and people around them and making sure that they just get some good practice uh, uh, at having a go at that you know and they probably will fail <laughs> you know that's completely natural we've all come away from a a, a, a discussion where we've been trying to influence or get somebody on board with something and we've licked our wounds and we've had to reflect and come back again and try something else so you know there's definitely a little bit of a going away with your tail between your legs involved in that learning process but I think it's just you know and I think that's where the resilience comes in, really, recognising that, you know, you're probably going to have to have more than one crack at the nut and, you know, rethink your approach and, and, and go again. So I think for me, it's just supporting people on that journey, giving them the confidence and and the knowledge and experience that, you know, they've got different things in their tool set that they can try. They play to their own strengths. You know, I'm a big believer in being you and, and, and going with, you know, being yourself and, and using that um in situations like that but also knowing where being somebody slightly different can can help with certain types of people as well so I think it's just sort of building that skill set of knowing yourself getting to know other people and having that toolkit I suppose of of techniques that you can try and uh, that you can draw on it sounds to me like you're very much a uh, a manager leader however you want to describe it that is more focused on on uh, people uh, rather than the the business or the job at hand would would that be fair to say yeah yeah 100 percent you know I've I've had teams you know in, in one form of another for 20 years god don't like to add these things up um and it, it is 100 percent the bit of the job that I enjoy the most and get the most from you know I think seeing somebody you know seeing somebody develop what and however you want to define that whether it's putting themselves in a situation that they might not have before you know trying something out that they didn't have the confidence before getting a new job even you know although it's always gutting to lose people you know when they've got to that point and they've 
shot and aimed for something that they really wanted and got there is 100% the most satisfying thing for me in my job. And I do truly believe, you know, and I've learned this through a lot of years experience that I am not going to succeed with my objectives and the things that I need to achieve if my team aren't happy, happy and functioning. They are my enablers in that way. So, you know, my number one priority every day is where is everybody? How is everybody? What have they got on today? What do they need from me? And if they just need me to go away and shut up, then that's great. But if they need something more practical, that's 100% my priority. Do you think that there is um, a validity in the types of managers that I, I kind of see as being sort of the opposite? It's not that they're, they're the, the, an, the, the anti-version, but mm. you there are very clearly types of people that go into management roles where their focus isn't on people. It's not the thing mm-hmm. that energizes them. Actually, it terrifies them. What they what they really like doing is logistics. I guess that's the best way of describing it. Do we do we need those types of people in these positions would like where you're at? That's a really, really good question. My gut is saying no. And I think that's probably just a personal bias that I am so far away from that. And I think I'd like to think that I've proven over the years in in a lot of job roles that, you know, by investing in your people, devoting time and energy in them, you get the best out of them and that delivers the business objectives, you know, the the ticks in the boxes or the things that were supposed to be counting. Um, And do we... I don't, I want to, I really want to say no. I think there maybe are just some people who, for their, however brilliant their mind is, there is absolutely a role for them and a senior role, no doubt, in an organisation. Mm. But maybe they need to leave the people side of things to people, who, you know, to others who have got that, that skill set. Do you think that there is potentially a role within within user research that that fits is is it more a lead researcher perhaps Mm, yeah yeah maybe maybe yeah because I think um you know I probably at the minute do a bit of lead because I don't have any um and you know sort of more you know more head of department or whatever you want to call it I probably do a mixture of the two Mm. and you know I do have to turn my logical analytical focused brain on sometimes um with those more logistical problems that that we do with you know maybe things that are in um you know the sort of more research op space so thinking about how the hell are we going to store things? You know, how are we, you know, going to pay for things? Um, and I do it and I do it quite ably, but it's 100% not not the sort of things I enjoy. Mm. I don't have an eye for detail, <laughs> <laughs> which is what lets me down in a lot of those scenarios. Procurement specifically, yeah, I get a lot, lot get in a lot of trouble with procurement. So yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, is is reops a space that you're looking at quite a lot at the moment? Then, mm, and is that something yeah. that you're looking to sort of hire a specific person in to facilitate? I would love to hire someone, just you know, from a personal perspective of me not being that great at it um but I think that's probably not on the horizon anytime soon for me it is something we're really focused on I think we spent the first year of being here at CQC just noses down getting through every day um you know dealing with things as they cropped up we were so reactive because you know there was nothing established nothing set up for us and we were just having to deal with time pressures and demands and all that Mm. so we've certainly tried to take over the last sort of four or five months a more proactive approach approach to sort of the research op stuff so you know we're, we again we're, we're trying to play to our strengths so we've we did a whole load of brainstorming you know informed by things that we've learned from the research op, research ops community which most of us are involved in so we spent a lot of time brainstorming the things that we don't think we were very good at in that space and that we could be better at um, and you know like every good user researcher we have a trello board <laughs> uh, you know, so we all take responsibility for things that that play a bit more into our skill set and we you know in our 
marginal time because we've all got so much of that we are slowly trying to chip away at those things and try and get a little bit more I, I hate to say things like rigor and process because that just doesn't feel natural to me but there are some situations where we do really you know especially around things like procurement um we do need a little bit more rigor and process in those so yeah we're, 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 we're picking them off um slowly but surely i uh being being heavily involved in the space myself i i think my main my main concern with it is that it's very much it's a scaling problem mm. uh oh, the way yeah. that a lot of us are looking at it like it's only it's an issue for everybody but the way that we're looking mm. at it is only really at an enterprise level um i think that's that's something that potentially needs to change over the next year we'll see what comes next no i agree okay so let's talk about your your challenges as a leader so you're you're going through the experience of of hiring what what are the big things that you're finding difficult in hiring user researchers i think um there's there's a mixture of things to me so i think there's definitely something about the locations that we're looking in and the salaries that we can offer so i'm broadly looking in big cities where you know there are lots of organizations looking for user research people or, or something that they call a different name but is broadly similar um and you know i i cannot compete salary wise with you know the likes of skybet or you know big organizations like that i can't even compete with some other public sector organizations so that is you know it, um, a, a challenge i think um it does feel like a, a, a job seekers market quite a lot of the time in the areas that I'm looking that people can really sort of pick and choose where they might want to go. So my focus is really trying to look at, you know, well, I can't offer you the big books, but I can appeal to your better nature yeah. in many ways. You know, what else can I offer you in terms of, you know, an attractive employment prospect? And, you know, I'm one of these annoying do-gooders. I could not go and work somewhere that was purely about the profit. I'm not interested in making the Airbnb app any better. Mm. It's no, it doesn't make my heart sing. Whereas, you know, doing I every day, I can see where the work that we're doing is making a difference to people who use health and social care. And I think we can all relate to that completely, whether it's to ourselves or relatives, you know, whatever the situation might be. So I think trying to tap into those networks and tap into those people where that, that sort of more, um, meaningful element is important to them is something that we've been really trying to get into um, and also sell the opportunity a little bit here um, you know the 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 ground is bare in many ways you know we're, we're really looking for people who are wanting to pick pieces of work or run with them influence shape really have an impact quite quickly on an organization that's trying to change the way it does so many things all at once so it's really to me for me just being keeping an eye on the market seeing who else is advertising seeing how that's going listening to the people who are applying for jobs you know what's appealing to them why do they want to come here what makes it an attractive proposition you know what aren't they so sure about or keen on and just really trying to make sure that we tailor not only our adverts but the way that we promote our adverts in that way really. Are you seeing any differences in that mentality around meaningful work with uh, with Gen Z because they're they're coming into the job market now and I, I'm yeah. of the impression and I'd like to think you know um, not sure when this comes out but ultimately last week all around the world we've we had these protest mm. marches i was in london on friday mm. in westminster mm. and it was it, it was something to see but ultimately it's being driven by people far younger than we are and and i i genuinely believe a lot smarter um <laughs> so uh, that kind of attitude and and this this socially aware uh mm. voice that is starting to emerge i I have to go on blind faith at the moment that that is going to, you know, find its way into the workplace. Do we run the risk of killing that b 
before before it's even like got off the ground, like introducing them into our organisations. I think it's a really good point, and I think you know the, the vacancies that we've been advertising recently. I've been really surprised, you know, how young some of the applicants have been. Um, you know, because I, I may, you know, this is this is my own bias completely. I think you know if I was starting out of this industry and I was twenty, you know, twenty two, twenty four, whatever, I would you know be absolutely wanting to go and work at you know, I was going to say Thomas Cook as a, an example there that's the worst example I can think of but you know go and work for Virgin Holidays and you know do something sexy and you know I'm sure the perks are amazing and you know so I've been really really surprised you know especially in what I sort of perceive rightly mm. or wrongly as that you know job seekers market that we've had so many of that 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 earlier generation come here and quite genuinely convince me and I suppose it doesn't take much because they didn't come to the interview for the salary but really gave me a very good story about why they want to do something meaningful and why it's important to them to be doing a job that contributes to society and, and makes life better for some people or a lot of people yeah. so it's it's been a shot I thought, I thought it was just me you know I was brought up to be super political which was very unusual probably <laughs> then you know when you know I wanted to you know go into the job center and get everyone a job and make everybody make society more equal well that didn't quite happen but you know that's what motivated me back in the day and I was very very unusual at that time. This is changing I suppose it's it's our responsibility to be thinking about how to how to best support that so what's uh what what do you see as being the 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 biggest challenges for those people particularly the, that younger generation of people the ones that don't have experience yet in getting into this industry uh you know user research user experience design public or private i i, I guess the challenges are ultimately still the same what what do you think they're they're facing against I think something that sort of struck a chord with me recently, because I've been thinking, you know, again, because we've been recruiting, I've been thinking about how we as a team reflect the, the user group that we are here to serve. You know, so for us, it's, you know, anybody in England um, and making sure that, we, you know, we are really representative. And I think something that struck me quite recently is that I've seen and heard about quite a lot of people starting user research internships as a way to get into the organisation, sorry, into the industry. And I think, well, that's great. But, you know, these people are earning practically nothing mm. you know so are probably and you know I'm not, I'm, this is a sweeping generalization but have probably got some money put aside or been still supported by their parents at that sort of young age and that equality then of opportunity being available to everybody to break in just doesn't feel like it's there you know if you've finished uni and you know you've got absolutely no choice to but to get the best paid job that you can do because you've got mountain student debts and no other support how can you possibly take an internship without sticking yourself further into debt so I've definitely been thinking about it of that how do we make sure that we are you know offering opportunities equally across you know just society because it's the right thing to do but also then how it helps us build inclusive teams that you know everybody can be um, has a chance of being a part of mm. based on skill and merit and behavior rather than just the people who can maybe work for free to get a foot in the door or whatever it might be well it's it's something which i've talked to quite a lot of people that that work in uh, in the public sector about of that we've We've got an emergence of changes to the UK laws around apprenticeships, but the idea of like digital skills apprenticeships still seems to be somewhat lacking. Is is that something that you've considered? Um, it's something I have definitely thought about. It's on the t the to do list, I guess, to it to, to um, investigate a little bit further because I come um, I come across a lot of people who are on the digital data and technology fast stream, um, and lots of them are getting user research and, and and other design placements as well as product and technical placements, which is fantastic, you know. But there are a set of people who have, you know, gone through quite a traditional educational route, come out the other side, and they're now effectively, you know, on a graduate scheme. Mm. Fantastic. But, you know, how do we offer that to offer that same opportunity to people who are slightly more 
less academically minded or certainly traditionally academically minded. And I think, you know, the apprenticeship route, you know, is something that we used quite heavily when I worked at DWP. Um, we'd use that for quite a few years in sort of operational roles. And as I moved away from there, it was something that was just starting to happen in, in more digital roles or, or tech roles and design roles. So it is definitely something that I would want to explore here. And I think one of the things that I've sort of been a little bit frustrated about recently is that through this sort of summer of recruitment, as I now refer to it, I've very much been looking for senior people. And that's for a reason. You know, that that's where we are at the minute. I need the experience. I need people to to crack on and 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 you know move forward as quickly as possible. But I think very I think a lot about well where's that next layer of people? Yeah, where's where the next where generation? am I bringing people in behind that? Because I've seen some fantastic people who, you know, if I could offer, if I had the ability to offer them, you know, a position, a, a, you know, a slightly lower level of responsibility, more room to learn and grow and develop. And also if I had time to support all that, which is, you know, another issue, I that's absolutely what I want to do. So whether we end up doing that through something like apprenticeships, whether it's, you know, just through a more traditional job offering route, but I also want to offer that internally as well. I think, you know, there's a lot of people internally in this organisation who, like me, have probably got great skills and great capability and potential to make that transition, whether it's into research, design, content, whatever it might be, and, and how we give those people an opportunity as well to to get into what I suppose people label as a newer industry mm. or you know certainly one that's more unfamiliar to people so yeah I definitely want to you know next sort of six months for me is definitely going to be exploring those avenues and seeing what we can do to 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 bring in that next generation well I hope that we get to uh, keep following and seeing what happens with that <laughs> oh god that gives me pressure <laughs> 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 You'll get there. You'll get there. I'm gonna have to do it now, aren't yeah. I? I'm gonna actually have to do uh, it. Uh you're also gonna have to blog about it as well. That's 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 the new deal. So Oh um, yeah. Oh blog, <laughs> yeah. There's never any time for blogging. More, more, more. If people want to find out more about what you're doing at CQC and about you personally and follow you where can they go yeah so most of my work related activity I do through Twitter so you can follow us there so I am at J-O-O-K underscore you are she says with reasonable confidence so yeah you can find <laughs> me there so um, uh, we also publish quite a lot of blogs through Medium but you know I retweet those quite a lot as well so yeah good good way to get in touch with us Fantastic. Uh, Joe. thank you so much for taking the time out today to speak to us. You're really welcome. It was very enjoyable. Thanks for having me. So there we are. We've come to the end of another episode and I really enjoyed listening back to that. I hope you did too. There's lots to think about and a question I want to leave open to you is what can you do to help the next generation of designers succeed in creating meaningful digital businesses? If you'd like to come and join us, Maybe you want to share your experiences or talk about something we've previously discussed. I truly mean this. Get in touch at theuxcoach.com. I'll be back in a few weeks with another guest to talk about design and user research careers, the challenges ahead and advice on personal development. I'll see you then.